Thank you, Howard. Good evening and welcome to Through the Keyhole, the show that gives you a first-class seat beside the firesides of the famous. Tonight, as always, we've borrowed the keys to two fascinating homes belonging to well-known personalities. And with the help of our house detective and portable transatlantic treasure, Lloyd Grossman, we'll be taking a privileged peep behind closed doors. But the question is, whose? Well, to try and answer that question, we have on my left, ladies and gentlemen, the ultimate in contemporary lifestyle environment, people. Three of them, in fact. First of all, his recreations are listed in who's who as losing weight, gaining weight, and parking. Well, he can have a parking space on our panel any time he likes. And right now, there's at least half an hour on the meter, Mr. Willie Rushton. Okay. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. Any woman obviously has the right to her opinions. In the case of our next guest, so do we. If Sigmund Freud were alive today, he'd be calling her for advice. Yes, Anna Raven. <laughs> Mind you, that's if he wasn't calling our next guest for advice, his grandson, Sir Clement Freud. <laughs> Let me tell you a little more about the old game. Uh, with the help of these magic keys, we'll be taking a careful look inside two fascinating homes. And that should tell us something about the person or persons who live there. All that our friends have to do is to try and work out who that is. So let's join Lloyd right now at home number one. And watch closely, because remember, the clues are there as we go through the keyhole. This house belongs to someone with a sense of history and a lot of historical heroes, all from the 19th century. There's the Duke of Wellington, Napoleon III, and a very combative Gladstone and Israeli. So maybe this person is quite aggressive as well. Now, aside from having a sense of history, he also has a fine sense of direction. There are these labyrinthine corridors everywhere. This dining room is a bit of a shrine to Victorian England. Indeed, there's Her Majesty herself in a very unfamiliar pose, spinning. So this person is probably quite industrious and hardworking. Now, there are lots of bits of Victoriana scattered around. There's a Victorian owl, a Victorian prime minister, and lots of slightly disapproving Victorian faces looking down from the walls. This is rather a somber room. I think dining in here is quite serious with lots of highfalutin conversation. And look at that gong. Either this place belongs to a film fan or they're sticklers for old-fashioned social proprieties. There's another Queen Victoria in this small sitting room, so there's obviously a fondness for formidable ladies. Now, this room is on a Chinese theme, and it would be a splendid place to consume your takeaway from the Jade Garden. I think it shows that this person likes fancy dress. And they also like to keep every aspect of their lives separate. Hence, every room has a different theme. There's evidence of a tremendous fondness for birds here. We've got peacocks on the walls and peacocks in the garden as well. Many of the rooms in this house are based on a theme. And the books are arranged thematically as well. So we have sporting books, natural history books, books on topography. So this person has a very highly organized mind. It's probably someone who can do a lot of different jobs at once and do them all discreetly and efficiently. Even though that desk is obviously the scene of a lot of hard work, it's remarkably tidy. Now, they're not technologically very sophisticated, judging by this aging gramophone, but they're artistically quite sophisticated, and opera is particularly important to them. They have a slightly quirky sense of humor. Just look at this wonderful Victorian love seat. If you don't happen to like the person you're sitting next to, you can just turn away. <laughs> this bedroom is called the Venetian Room, and it's decorated with dozens of pictures of Venice. I think this person is a little bit obsessional, certainly a real enthusiast. And one thing he's enthusiastic about is a sort of nostalgic view of royalty. 
There are wonderful busts here of Edward VII and his queen, Alexandra. This person is also quite bold and doesn't really care what other people think. Look at the way he splashed this wild pattern wallpaper and fabric everywhere. The bedside reading is quite astonishing. It's certainly not what you'd find at the airport. This tiny room at the top of the house has been turned into an observatory. So someone here is a keen amateur astronomer. And that shows that they have an inquiring mind. They're always willing to learn about new things. Let's look at the evidence. The love of strong-willed women. The prominent gong. The philosophical bedside literature. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, but not for our panel, here's Whose House It Is. <laughs> William, pray begin the diagnosis. I was interested to see the bedside book called Who Moved the Stone. I thought that was Teddy Victorian for Did the Earth Move for You, Darling? <laughs> anyway, that is not going to be anything. I wrote down here, the moment I saw the house, I put right up Prince Charles's alley. That's the sort of place he likes. Big windows and very house and garden. Stuffed owls, stuffed prime ministers, stuffed Queen Victorias, um, high-tech Victorian sofas, all that. I thought it might be a museum, briefly. I thought it might be a trick on your part, that nobody actually lives there. Is it open to the public, this house? I don't think it is, no. Should be. You should have access to homes like that. Without entering the burglarious profession, I think one should be allowed into places like that. It's awful to think all that stuff, you can't see it unless it appears, unless Lloyd cracks it. Anna. I thought this person was almost certainly a writer. Dead Riffle. side. Writer. <laughs> because... Not solely a writer. Not solely a writer, but principally a writer, because that kind of... Um, organization and that kind of um, desk and that kind of bedside reading only ever means somebody who actually does write. I was interested in the, not so much in, in the, the, the Victorianism, which I, I regard as somebody who actually thinks the best days have already gone and it's, is monitoring the awful state we're in now. But in the portraits on the wall in the dining room, which seem to be all of rather high-minded philanthropic people, Certainly one of the statues that we saw, unless I'm much mistaken, was a great Victorian benefactor. So this is somebody who actually has a public image of being something that he privately is not. He might be seen as a very divided person, as somebody who is uh, quite formal and rather forbidding, but actually has very real concerns about quite serious things. Brilliant stuff. Clement. I was interested in the silver on the dining room table, which has a regimental ring about it, and thought there might be some military history in that family. I thought he was probably deaf, because the only people who keep peacocks in the garden that make an appalling <laughs> din are people who are very hard of hearing. Um, somebody who is very well organized, who is um, in, in, I mean, on the cemetery side of 50, in age. <laughs> Um, you mean, as Robin Day said to me once when... Who only did? has one telephone, which uh, in this day and age uh, makes him somebody who is outside the mainstream of public life. <laughs> Willie. Oh, philanthropic person, not short of loose change, writes outside the mainstream of life outside the mainstream of life it's a very good order of monks to belong to i think <laughs> <laughs> he is religious isn't he rather cheery monks yes um, well, now, with that evidence now i'd like you to zero in and i think i believe in your ability to find the name of this philanthropic religious well-organized cultivated writer and uh, and not just writer has he come to the attention of the public through television? Yes. But not greatly, otherwise they would have... Or oh, are they asleep? Let me just try and just see... Does he do the epilogue? No, no. Um, sense of history. Gladstone, Disraeli, Victorian Prime Minister statue, religion, artistically sophisticated, lover of opera, 
Religious books by bed. He's appeared on television with William Rushton and I. <coughs> and me. And with you. No, you? no, no. No. Correcting your grammar. Well, you've got... You've... You've, <laughs> you've been very... <laughs> You've been very complimentary about the house. Yes. You've summed up the man. Anna's earlier description was very accurate. But you haven't got the fact that direct from not direct, direct from not so much a program, more a way of life. Come on, Willie. He was then Norman St. John Stevens. He's now Lord St. John of Forsley. Don't remember him. <laughs> Well, they, everybody loved the house, and then they didn't make the final uh, leap of imagination there. They were jolly good, actually. Yes, uh, they, analysis. They, they, caught, mm. they caught your character very well, I thought. That. Tell me one thing that I haven't had a chance to ask you, because I feel it's a great loss from our national life. Couldn't you have got the title Lord St. John Stevens of Forsley? Um, I think it would have been uh, difficult, because I wanted a territorial title I as such. I'm sorry, I'm croaking, so... You're so moved by what they've said. <laughs> or you've got no, I've got a terrible cold. Oh, I see. But I didn't want to disappoint Thank you. you. Thank you. But I mean, so that, so that you wanted a territorial... I wanted a, yes, because I think if you go to the House of Lords, you should take a territorial title, because that was always the custom before, until modern times, mm. which I'm outside the mainstream of, I guess. Yes, you're... They, they also... Now, what's Clay pointed to on his notes? <laughs> I, I, I just thought he might have got foul pest from his peacock. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you feel, as, as someone was saying, that this is someone, one of them said, who feels that the best days have already gone, they just said. Do you feel that way about the modern world versus the past? No, on the whole, I don't think I do. I like the past, particularly the Victorian past, because it throws light on the present. It's, uh, we're able to see the era, but uh, we're living through the same problems. <coughs> If you go to the 18th century, it seems as remote as the Stone Age, really. So far away. Mm. Tell me, I read in your bio, which I hadn't realized, because I know of your, your deep uh, Catholic faith, that you actually were tempted at one time to be a priest? Yes, I was. But I found it, I think, the idea too restricting. Um, it was before the Vatican Council, and I tend to be a free spirit. I'm rather like Anna in that way, though we differ on certain points. And um, at that time, I don't think it would have suited me, but it's not too late. No, there's, there's plenty of time yet. Yes. Are you, as uh, Clement so eloquently put it, on the cemetery side of 60? Yes. No, it's at the cemetery side of 50. And I should 50. think it's, it's Clement is probably on the cemetery side of 60. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have here, this is not 19th century, this is not Victorian, this is not 18th century. Gladstone, Disraeli, and Badgett wouldn't recognize it. But it is the memorial through the keyhole key oh. as a token okay. of our appreciation for your being with us tonight. How very kind of you. Our thanks to Lord St. John of Forsley. We'll take a break and come rushing back. Warner Home Video presents... Beetlejuice! It's showtime. Can you be scary? What do you think of this? <laughs> Michael Keaton and the ghost with most babe. is a ghost called Beetlejuice now available on video and Touchstone Home Video presents Good morning, Vietnam! It's Robin Williams comedy blockbuster coming soon on video Good morning Vietnam is a hit reserve your copy now What can you do with a strawberry you can create a sensation with the definitive library of sweet sensations. From simple bakes and easy makes to classic cakes. With step-by-step know-how to turn anything into a sensational sweet. The Flymo Multitrim isn't just a trimmer. One twist and it's a lawn edger too. So in next to no time, you can trim all the untidy parts of your garden. The Flymo Multitrim. Why slow trim when you can fly trim? Oh, uh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my word. 
There's only one way for the ski instructor to give set yogurt the taste of real fruit, and that's to put real fruit juice in it. New Smooth Ski, a set yogurt with real fruit juice, as recommended by the ski instructor. Sarah Brightman sings Anything But Lonely from Andrew Lloyd Webber's Aspects of Love, available now at all good record shops. Welcome back, welcome back to Through the Keyhole. Our speciality of the house is, as always, Lloyd Grossman, from Bay. Let's join him right now at house number two as we go through the keyhole. Well, these are very dull colours. Maybe a highly strong person lives here and they were advised not to have too much decorative excitement. There seems to be a love of flowers in this house. There are wonderful floral prints and these beautiful roses. So someone here is a bit of a gardener. What I like, though, are these frightfully aristocratic clay pigeons. <laughs> We've got more Wedgwood in the sitting room here. It's frightfully English, isn't it? So perhaps there's an American influence at work. Now, there are two quite extraordinary paintings on the wall. I never knew that Peter Scott worked on Baco foil before. This is a real television family. They love watching the box. So much so, they've even made their fire look like a television set. Even though they like watching television a lot, they're a reading family. Now, there might not appear to be many books here, but boy, the ones they've got would take a heck of a long time to get through. I have a feeling that not very much cooking gets done in this spacious kitchen. It's more a food preparation area for a busy family, hence the prominence of the microwave. And this rather comprehensive collection of packets, soups and sauces. But there's a rather wonderful carousel of hot and exotic spices here. So I think these people are probably quite ethnic and passionate. They certainly seem to have a liking for Hollywood. Just look at that director's chair. And this is awfully handy, a hotline to Kermit. <laughs> this huge throne virtually dominates this tiny room, so someone here has a colossal ego. Now, this room is quite interesting because it's a combination playroom, music room, and study. But whoever lives here doesn't like music at all. There's a vast record collection, but it's a complete mess. So these people are absolutely incapable of any sort of organization. They are zany, fun people, though. Look at all these jocular stuffed animals. There are some very interesting objects here, though. Here, for example, is a model of next year's Lada. And look at this, the world's first mobile telephone. Now, the home office is really not terribly impressive. Firstly, they're very unlikely to get a life peerage. Secondly, there seems to be a complete absence of any sort of conventional office equipment. This is quite a contrast from all the lunacy next door. But in spite of the attempt at some bits of floral decoration, this room is very plain, even slightly staid. And I can't help feeling that this family don't use this dining room very much at all. This is quite a tranquil feeling bedroom, but I notice there's a bit of wild humor in the bedside reading. There's quite a lot of pine in this room, and it gives the place a slight colonial American atmosphere. Let's look at the evidence. The aristocratic clay pigeons, Kermit's telephone, the anarchic record library. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Lloyd. And now, for our home and studio audience, here's Who's House of Pigeons. <laughs> Here's 
he of the Walderswick persuasion shall begin. Clement. It seemed a sort of unlived in house. Um, I'd be surprised if it were someone's only residence. Um, I, I thought they probably won a lot of raffle prizes because there seems no connection between the things that they had in their sitting room. Anna. Um, well, there's a child in this house because otherwise there's no reason for the, 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 the model that's made of Duclo and the um, telephone toy and various things that were in that room alongside the music collection. Journalist or media, yeah. Um, I wasn't off-put by the disorder of the music collection. I thought that probably indicated that it was used quite frequently, actually. Definitely. William. Well, she's done it. Why would he say... He is completely mad, Lloyd. He said this is all terribly English, so perhaps an American influence yeah, is at work. Yeah. Yeah. What sort of yeah. mad... What, who is this person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was because, because of Wedgwood being a great American uh, favourite. So is Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are we saying here? <laughs> he, was, he was feeling lonely in that very uh, English house. Carry on. So it is the, are we therefore looking for an American colonial who has an ethnic microwave, who wrote The Princess Bride, or appeared in it, and uses old 78s a lot. That got tremendous applause, the use of old 78s. No, the use of records got applause. The use I of records. Wonder, I wonder whether the way those records were thrown about, um, whether the person who owns them actually bought them. Those sort of records that, I mean, if he were a presenter of a, of a radio... <laughs> Right, we've got radio, we've so got music, would... we've got... Can you do it? He's a he... DJ. <laughs> you need to know that he's married to an American, I suppose? Yes, we do. He would. I don't know. <laughs> we um, need to know. But now... Me. Who is he? He proposed to his wife on the radio. It is, will you come... Go on, then. Go on, no, go, go on. on. No, you do it. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Who? You go, uh, uh, go on, say uh, something, uh, he's only good on, uh, I can't, I've blanked. Will you come through the keyhole? Steve Wright. Well. Is that true, you did propose to Cindy on the radio? Yes, I did, yeah. What did you say? I said, darling, will you marry me? And she, f she got to an AA box, called the AA, the AA got through to the show live and said she says yes. Oh. All together, come along. Oh. Excuse me, is, are you the originator of Dr. Mad? Mr. Mad. Mr. Yes. Mad. Yes. My husband will never speak to me again that I didn't get your name. He is your greatest fan. He thinks you're the best thing that's happened to radio. Oh. <laughs> so are you. Oh, no, thank you. Oh, that's nice. That is very nice. Now, did you recognize yourself from the portrait that was painted of you there? Not at all. My wife is American, obviously. Uh, she's from Connecticut. The flowers are hers. Uh, the toys are our young son's Tommy's. Uh, but I didn't know. I mean, the, the records are obviously mine. But what I do do with records is, is pick them yes. from the shelf, yes. take them away, play them on the radio, and then bung them back. But as Clement said, you didn't pay for them. I suppose it, uh, that was rather... Yeah, I paid for everyone, Dave. Everyone. Six and eight. The BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Please, why was the chair three. from the princess? Why the chair from the princess? I think bride? that was a that was a film promotion for the for the film The Princess yes, Bride. Yes, and you just like the chair. Yeah, I thought oh, that right. was great. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be a director, so I kept the chair. Did you actually say, as Coleman Balls says, and remember, you can hear the two minute silence tomorrow on Radio One? That was me. That was. That was it's me. true. Great yeah. line. Yeah. It's true. One of my worst, really, yeah, David. Uh, very good. <laughs> no, one other one. True. One other Coleman Bulls you've done that like you cherish. I can't. I can't recall. That was a great one. You like that? that I loved it. And we loved having you with us, Steve. And we know Thank you've you. rocketed up from your show to be here with us and uh, done it in record time. And we'd like to present you with this souvenir, Steve. Well, thank you very the much. The Through the Keyhole Memorial Key. Thank you. To say our thanks to you for being with us. You're a real delight. A real delight. And a great job of me, too. Our thanks to Steve Wright. Our thanks, of course, to Lord St. John of Forsley, who came along in the spirit of the show must go on, despite his throat.
condition, and our thanks because of his throat condition to William Rushton. <laughs> and to Anna Rayburn. And to Sir Clement Freud as well. Until the next time, goodbye for now.